So welcome, guys. Um, <coughs> my name is Mishko Hevery. I, I work here at Google. And uh, I always try to come up with crazier and simpler ways of doing stuff. And one of the things I got into recently uh, is actually JavaScript. I've only been doing JavaScript for about two years. And um, you know that's how I kind of discovered Node.js and just how amazed I was by it. But anyways, so on the client side, building web applications, building Ajax applications, for those of you who have tried it, it's a real pain. How many of you guys have tried building a web app? It is a real pain in the butt, isn't it? And so you know, what, what people end up doing is they create a bunch of libraries to make your life easier. And uh, I basically kind of looked at it from a different point of view and said, could we build a web app but just make our life easier? Not because we have libraries to make our life easier, but because browser is just smarter. And so this is why I'm, uh, what I mean by uh, when I say it's a radically different way of building Ajax applications. So what is Angular? It's kind of hard to explain, and so I'm going to give it a try. Uh, but fundamentally, it's not a library. It's not a library like jQuery or Clojure for manipulating a DOM. It's not a library like Clojure or Dojo for having your widgets. It's not a framework like Sinatra where it's that, oh, if you play by our rules, we'll, you know, we have done all the hard work and you just plug in your individual pages here. Uh, I like to say in libraries, you get to call the library and in the framework, the framework calls you. Angular is neither of them. What Angular is, it's a smarter browser. Angular is what a browser would have been like if it was specifically designed for building Ajax applications. Uh, obviously, browsers are not designed for building Ajax apps. They're designed for, building, uh, for showing static documentation. So Angular is to dynamic documents what HTML is to static documents. Uh, this slide over here is going to make a lot more sense after I give the demo. But, you know, every single kind of uh, system has kind of a model view controller. and Everybody says that it has completely different meaning to if you talk to five different people. It will probably have a different meaning in, in this world that I'm going to present. Uh, I just want to point out that we do have a separation between model view controller. What the view is in our system is the pure HTML. What the model and the controller is, is JavaScript. Really, model is the JSON, and the controller in our world is the JavaScript that you write. And then we have a couple of services, which is stuff that's useful for building web apps. Uh, but the key thing that makes all this thing possible is two-way data binding. And we'll talk about all this stuff later in a second. So really, the core of it is the two-way data binding. So let me give you a demo. Uh, so as I said earlier, what we're going to end up building by end of today is this Buzz client. Uh, but we're going to start with a very, very simple demo, and that is this. So here we go. So if I have a simple HTML like this, uh, which I'm sure you've seen before, and the really interesting part is this. You know, I have an input field that says world, and I want to say hello world right here. And what I really want to say to the system is, look, take the input field over here and put it over here, right? Now, if you open this up in a, in a browser, uh, it looks like this. And most importantly, it doesn't do anything, right? This is the standard static document that we're all familiar with, and it's all boring. So how can we teach a browser new tricks? Uh, so we do this by including the Angular uh, script tag inside of it. And again, I want to point out that I'm not really uh, teaching, uh, I'm not really calling any code, right? I haven't changed anything. I haven't written any extra code. The browser just became smarter all of a sudden. So if I refresh my browser, all of a sudden, world gets copied down here. Now, not only that, as I type, it immediately copies it over. This is what I mean by data binding. It's, it's literally moving the data over because I said that, that the, the name here and the name there is one of the same thing. OK, so how can you use data binding to do something interesting? Well, let's see. Uh, darn, I forgot my cheat sheet. One second. My cheat sheet is this. So if you wanted to uh, uh, talk to Google Buzz, there's a particular URL we can hit, and Google Buzz will give back our data. And so now the, the hard part of building a web application is, how do I take this raw JSON data and present it to the user in some kind of a form? 
So how can we do this? Well, the first concept, uh, what we have done here, let's see. Uh, we, uh, I mean, I'm already included a buzz.javascript right here, which is empty. So I'm going to uh, declare a uh, my application, let's say, or buzz demo. And one of the things we want the buzz demo to have is access to resources. And I'm sorry, this is kind of complicated, so I'm going to have to copy it over. Um, and what this basically says is that, you know, if we go back to, oops, here we go. You know, see this complicated URL up here? It's, it's JSON, well, this is where you drop the name, et cetera. That URL is essentially this piece over here. It says, well, this is the URL that you have, and I want you to talk to this URL using the JSON P protocol, and the callback for the JSONP is this thing. Are you familiar with JSONP, folks? Some of you guys, maybe? OK, it's just a way of fetching the data uh, from the client. And most importantly, I'm going to name this particular thing called activity, uh, because that's what the Google Buzz uses. They, they call it an activity. And I'm going to give it two methods called get and reply. Uh, so if I say activity.get, uh, it will take the self into visibility, so this thing will become visibility, but if I say replies, then the self will be dropped over here, but furthermore, the comments will be dropped up here, and then the user ID and activity ID is what the user will have to su uh, supply. So basically, I'm uh, building a kind of a language for talking to uh, uh, JSON stream that uh, Google Buzz provides. Okay. Uh, now, the other part is, we. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Juice? All right. So we have dependency injection in here, and so we need to say we, we want to inject resource, and that's the resource here. OK, now this in itself won't do anything yet, but what we want to do in, in our HTML is we want to say, actually, uh, I want to put some behavior, some controller behind this view, because HTML is just a view, so I'm going to say controller is equal to buzz controller. And inside of my buzz, I'm going to declare a controller. So I'm going to say a function buzz controller. And in here, I'm going to say buzz prototype. And let's make a method called fetch. And let's keep it simple here. I'm going to say this dot, uh, I think I called it, one second, I called it activities. This dot activities is equal to this dot activity. This is the guy which we declared up here get, that's this method down here, and we want to call a get on user ID is uh, Google Buzz. Um, right, and so in the, const in the constructor of this thing, we're going to say this dot fetch. Okay. So when the controller comes up, it's going to call the fetch method, and the fetch method will go and fetch all the activities for Google Buzz. Now, that is not going to do much yet, so let's delete this demo over here and say pre-activities is equal to and with a little bit of luck, oops, I made a mistake. All right, what did I make a mistake on? Oh, I see. Waha. All right, I think this works. There you go. So what, what has just happened? Uh, what I asked the system to do, if you look at our HTML, I simply said, instantiate the bus controller in the controller's constructor we call the fetch method, and the fetch method, 
uh, maybe I should put this next to each other like this, the fetch method assigned all of the activities from the JSONP into the activities variable. And all I'm saying here is print out the activities variable so that I can dump it out. And so as you can see, when I refresh, there's a second when the activities is empty, and eventually the data shows up and draws what we have. Excellent. So the, the next thing we probably want to do is just fetch the data for different people, not just for us. So let me cheat a little bit here. Um, this ready. OK. So let's do a div and say input type name user ID and button fetch click fetch ah. okay so now we're going to change the code a little bit. So instead of doing it in the constructor, we're going to remove that. And instead of um, just always grabbing Google Buzz, we're going to grab this this dot user ID. That's the same user ID that you see over here. So now I'm going to refresh this, and I'm going to say Google Buzz fetch and uh, after a second, data comes, and I can say, fetch myself, and I get different set of data for different people. So, so far we're making some progress, right? I mean, we can fetch our data set and display it. So the next thing we'd like to do is instead of dumping the data in a raw format, uh, it'd be nice if we could somehow format it nice and pretty. So, um, Just going to cheat a little bit here because I don't remember everything. All right. So we're going to make a UL, which is uh, unordered list. And then we're going to say li. And inside of the li, let's say if I go back over here, let's say I just, as you can see, we have activities. Activities has data. And the data has a collection of items uh, over here. And items, for example, has. Uh, the text and the text is, let's see, items, actor. Oh, sorry, okay, so the actor is the person who did the activity, and the object.content has the particular thing. So what we want to do is we want to show the content for each of the uh, each of the uh, the uh, buzzes, right, that were uh, done over there. So we're gonna say uh, ng repeat. So we want to repeat the li element for each item in activities dot data dot items. And what we want to print in the middle of it is, is item dot object dot content, right? Because once we find the items over here, when we go to the uh, object.content, it will print out the content of it. So if I save this and I do refresh and I do fetch, we have individual LIs for each of the uh, text that the people put in. But as you notice, th this is actually bolds and breaks and so on and so forth. This is actually HTML. So we're going to change it a little bit and we're going to say actually the, the data is HTML. So this is called a filter. So we can massage the data before we show it. So now we do the same exact thing. And voila, we have individual Google Bus chats from them. So now what I'm going to do next is um, I already prepared a nice CSS for us. So I'm going to cut and paste the CSS here. And if I do that, then I should get a little prettier view. So just a little CSS magic to make it nicely formatted. OK, uh, so what's the next thing we would like to do? The next thing we'd like to do is we'd probably like to put a 
uh, who is buzzing this particular thing on the top. But by the way, let me stop for a second and ask, are there any questions? Yes. What was the ng tag? You mean ng repeat? Uh, okay, so this is a good point. Let's let's stop for a second. Uh, what am I doing here? What I said earlier is that Angular teaches the browser new tricks, right? It is what HTML would have been like if it was designed for building web applications. So one of the common things for basically we need to do in web applications is templating, right? And HTML is almost there, but lacks certain things. And so what if we could basically create uh, what I call markup in directives, which is basically brand new attributes that the browser doesn't understand. What if we could just add it to the browser's vocabulary so that when the browser sees this, it will run this? So let me point out something interesting. I'm just going to disable this uh, script doc for a second by putting an X over here. And I'm going to refresh this. Notice that it's just HTML, nothing special. It's served at a file colon slash slash. There is no server processing anything. All the magic is happening on a client. This really is a smarter browser. Just by re-enabling that script tag, all of a sudden, uh, we're back in, in, in business. Does that make sense? OK, any other questions? Yes. Yes. So, so the question is, can you create more than one iframe and, and, and things, right? More controllers. More controllers, exa exactly. Yes, uh, the, the answer is, I'm just giving you an introduction to what this thing can do. Uh, yes, we understand the concept of routes, controllers, partials. Uh, we can include other HTML dynamically loaded in. Uh, there is no limit to what you can do. And, and also, what, we, what, what Angular actually is, if you step back further, is actually HTML compiler on the client. Now, if you think about it for a second, it sounds like an oxymoron. Like, what do you mean HTML compiler on a client? It actually allows you to give meaning. What does it mean, meaning? Uh, it allows you to attach JavaScript behavior to any HTML primitive, either an element, an attribute, a tag, or a piece of text. And that's what we're doing. There is a, 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 a function somewhere that says, if you come across an ng controller in your HTML, then execute this piece of JavaScript, which makes it look like there's a controller. If you come across a double curly, which is over here, then do some other work. If you come across a, a, uh, uh, an input type text, well, then register a listener on that input so that as the user type, I can update the model, right? And so what we really have is just an HTML compiler that executes in the client. And I believe somebody else had a question, or was that already answered? It was answered. All right. Okay, so let's see if we go can go a little further. So uh, I'm going to cut and paste a little bit of stuff from my existing thing. And that is to make it a little prettier. And now notice just this is very little, uh, you know, really trivial amounts of code that I'm pasting here. Uh, all I'm doing here is I'm adding, oh, yes, you're required. And I messed something up. You are, oh yes, I copied this in the wrong location. And the fetch doesn't do the work because I have, oh right, okay. I did some other magic here. So let me show you what we're trying to get to. What we're trying to get to is, is if I hit a refresh, uh, I actually continue having the user ID in here, right? Uh, and the nice thing about that is um, 
you know, it's bookmarkable. So I can take the bookmark and email it to somebody. Not only that, my back button now works. And if I go to previous, you know, it said Google Buzz. This is the old already working client, right? And so I would like to get deep linking working in my application. So obviously we, uh, when I type in something here, and I hit fetch, notice that the URL actually changed up here. So how did that work? Uh, that worked because the, the new code I pasted in, it says button on click, take the user ID and copy it into the location hash path. That's basically the URL that you have. So we're gonna do a little bit of changes on our, on our buzz client. Oops. So let's see. What we're gonna say is, in order to enable this, we're gonna say watch the URL. And all right, and if the URL changes, call this.userChange. And we're gonna have a user change method that says, um, if the URL changed it, then copy this dot user ID, copy the location. Right, that's the, the, the URL of the person we want to get a buzz information. Copy it to user ID. The reason we're copying it to user ID is because we're trying to get it into our input field over here. That's the user ID field. And then once we have it, I want to go and simply go fetch all of the activities for that user ID. So now, we have an exception, line 12. Uh, oh, yes, thank you very much. Ah, here we go. So what does this do? What it does is that we are watching the URL, which means if I go and change this to Google Buzz, hit enter, uh, notice it automatically copied it into the input field and also it fetched the data for our application. What that does is that the back button now works. If I hit back button, I go to Mishko Heavery. If I go forward button, I go to Google Buzz. Now, for those of you guys who've done GWT or Ajax raw, getting deep linking to work is a nightmare, right? Okay, nobody has done it apparently because nobody's shaking their heads. But yes, it's a nightmare. And this actually is pretty trivial if you think about it, right? You're just watching a URL. If it changes, you're calling some method and things get updated. Now, I want to show you one more thing, and that is if I click on replies, currently it doesn't do anything, but if I click on replies, I would like to go and show all the replies in line. Uh, so I'm going to, again, just copy this piece of code. So I copied an expand replies method, and all it basically does is it says, uh, if I don't already have a replies, then uh, go and fetch them over here. Otherwise, flip a flag called show, and we'll, we'll deal with the flag in a second. Uh, so that makes it that if I click on it, it will go and fetch additional data. But the problem is our template doesn't show any additional data. So Let's go back to our template and I'm trying to remember where to paste this. Oh, I think it's right here. Here we go. Yep, so here comes our replies. So what did I paste over here? I simply said, uh, give me another UL. The LI inside of it repeats for every reply in item replies.data items. And the reason why it's data items is because uh, we wrote into the activity replies, right? The item replies now contains the new data. And we show the image and the URL and, of course, the content HTML. And so the end result is that we can see the replies being inlined in our application. So I can go to any, let's, uh, oh, 
of course it's not there's no way to hide it now so what we need to do is we need to say ng dot show if um, item dot replies dot show that's the boolean flag that I had a second ago expand collapse right so we can expand and collapse this um, oh yeah and it would be nice if I could search up here right so the searching is actually very trivial because all one has to do is when you go when we iterate over the items we simply say uh, dot filter um, filter on this input field over here and now we can see if anybody's buzzing or about me and the answer is no uh, node no uh, Google well that's probably everywhere uh, I see okay New York here we go New York there we go uh, so searching instantaneous searching is really really trivial because you know uh, Angular kind of behaves like a spreadsheet. You change a variable and all the other pieces automatically recompute and all this magic is happening through data binding. So I want to show you one more thing and then I'm going to kind of talk about more the, the structure of it. Uh, if we go look at the final product over here, if I click replies, notice that it kind of scrolls. This might be too many replies in here. here. Notice it kind of scrolls up and then it scrolls back down when it closes. And let's say we want to add this effect to our application. So what we really want to do is uh, is say something like this: my expand show or expand when I when when basically this thing is there, right? Uh, so I just made up basically a term called expand. HTML browser doesn't know what it is, and neither does Angular. And so uh, actually nothing's going to happen if I, I'll show it to you. Uh, if I expand, the items will come, but they no longer collapse because I took the show part out. Uh, and of course, none of the, the magical scrolling is happening. So how can we add the behavior? Uh, well. This is where uh, you can take away from existing libraries like jQuery or Clojure or Dojo or any other JavaScript libraries that are already out there and you can integrate them in. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to basically copy a little bit of code that teaches Angular new tricks or rather teaches the browser new tricks. And what I'm saying here is this. If you come across my expand tag then I want you to execute this function. And this function basically says that the element should have a CSS property display block. And the reason why it has to have a display block is because browsers has never seen it, and so it doesn't know whether it's an inline or a block uh, uh, property. Uh, this is a compiler directive that says, keep on compiling. The stuff that's underneath me should be compiled as well. And uh, because it's a compiler, it has two phases. It has a linking phase and a compile phase. So the first function we return is a compile phase, which gets to massage the HTML. But because you're inside of a repeater, you might have to relink once for every instance of that repeater, right? Because repeaters can expand and, uh, and uh, collapse. So this basically says, OK, here is a compile function, which basically says, for each item uh, inside of a repeater, if you happen to be in one, uh, hide the element by default. Watch the expression expand. That's because the ex uh, we created an expand attribute over here. So whatever is in there, grab that uh, element and then watch it. If the variable changes, then if the value is true, then create, this is jQuery, by the way, so create the slide down uh, um, behavior. And if it becomes false, then do the slide up behavior as well. So we have to include jQuery in our application, but it doesn't have to be jQuery. It could be any other existing library that you already know and love. And now if I refresh this, and if I grab something that doesn't have too many replies, you see we have the scrolling up and down. 
So we are teaching the browser new tricks. So the way to think about this thing is that your HTML is your view. And HTML basically is kind of a DSL, right? It's a domain-specific language for laying out your document. That's what the, the HTML is. Uh, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to expand that DSL into realm of what is useful for building web applications. Well, what's useful for building web applications is stuff like repeaters, conditionally showing and hiding things, creating listeners, firing off things, copying data back and forth, and so on. Uh, so we added all of this uh, out of the box, but really we give you the freedom to add anything else that you want into HTML, and basically you get to build out your own language to it. And now somebody asked me if, you, if we can do something more complicated uh, with this thing. And the answer is yes. We have something called services. One of the services, for example, URL routing service, where you can say, if the URL looks like this, then load this controller and this partial. But if the URL changes, then load some other controller and some other partial. And then you can nest these partials into each other. And you really uh, assemble the application on the fly in a browser. Does that kind of make sense? All right, uh, uh, questions? OK. So let's see, let's go back. So we kind of did a demo. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's a compiler. And so I kind of highlighted a couple of things in here for you. Uh, the, the area in yellow that's this thing over here, we call this a widget. So if you come across a any either something the browser knows how to render, like an input tag, or something the browser does not know how to render, something you create your own, uh, you can cause the compiler to trigger some compile function. Uh, so in our case, what we trigger over there is a listener that says, OK, register a listener on an input field. If the input field changes, then copy the value of the input field from the email into the controller. right? Uh, and oh, by the way, this better be an email. It's something that I haven't shown over here, but I should. Uh, for example, if I delete the text over here, it becomes red. And if I hover over it, it says, well, it's required. And how did it know that? It knew that because our user ID has a attribute called ng required. And so, I added the meaning to an input field. I said, well, if you see ng required, then complain if you don't have a particular attribute. Um, so this is what we call widgets, right? And you can write your own. Uh, we also have the concept of directives, which is additional attributes that are added to existing elements, which basically change behavior. So one that I showed you is the repeat element that basically says, oh, Take this as a template and repeat it for once in each of the, the following expression. And the expression can return either an array or an object, but more importantly, the expression gets reevaluated whenever anything changes. So this filter function gets reevaluated whenever email changes up here. So this email over here causes this expression to reevaluate, and then the, the uh, repeater either adds or removes the li elements into your DOM tree to produce the rendering. Uh, this is a markup uh, that you see over here. Uh, this basically, we can intercept any text and give it meaning. So I chose the double curlies as a way of dealing with this thing, but you could uh, create your own um, expressions inside of HTML or own text that means something special to you, uh, and you can attach behavior to it as well. And then we have a concept of a filter, which is that it takes the value of this and runs it through another function to make it uppercase. This is very common when you need to uh, format your data into a locale or internationalize it or something like that, or maybe uh, INTNN, et cetera. And then here is a, an example of a brand new widget, like a switch statement that you're all familiar with uh, from programming. It really doesn't exist in HTML, but we can create one by simply saying switch on some particular expression and if the expression has the word home, then show this diff. But if the expression has, let's say, account, oops, then go and include another HTML file called account HTML from a different location and then inline it into this particular thing. This goes back to somebody's, somebody's questions over here, whether you could have partials. 
Um, so I'm just kind of showing how you can turn HTML into a DSL so that you can build up anything that's meaningful for yourself. One of the things we, for example, we do on our project is that we have a, we say button all of our, our HTML, but we really want to have a nice, pretty closure button. So we have a directive that basically says, oh, if you come across a button, replace it with this really fancy closure button. And so our HTML is nice and clean uh, without having to go into details of adding CSS, et cetera, to make it style properly. Okay, I want to talk about data binding for a second, uh, which might not have been obvious. So data binding is kind of one of those overloaded terms that is uh, used all over the place. And so in most templating systems that I have worked with, uh, they have this property that you have a template and you have a model, and you merge the two and you produce a view. And this is a one-way street. That is, if the model changes, you have to re-merge with the template and you have to change the view. And the problem is that what if the user has modified the view in the meantime? You're basically clobbering them, right? And uh, Nick's working with, the, with these kinds of templating system, kind of great for initial rendering of the page, but then you have this whole second problem is how do I get the data back out of the page and into a model? So what Angular does is does something I call two-way data binding. And the idea is that you take a template and you compile it into a view. And then the view and the model become tightly interlinked. That is, whether the user goes and changes the view by interacting with the HTML, for example, an input field and changes a field inside of it, or the JavaScript changes a, fee, uh, a property on some model, it doesn't matter. The, the data is immediately reflected on the other side. So if the JavaScript changes the model, the view updates. And if the, view, if the user changes the, the, the view, then the model updates. And this happens continuously. So what ends up happening is that your model is the single source of truth of application. You never have to parse data out of HTML. You never have to worry about like, well, did the user type something somewhere and so maybe my model is stale or something like that. The model is always the, the truth. Um, and so here's a couple of more uh, places where you can read up on this. So there's, of course, the angularjs.org, which is where we have most of our documentation and uh, uh, things related to Angular. Uh, the current demo you can see over here, and also the the demo that I've kind of done over here, and the idea of resources is kind of uh, placed up there as well. Uh, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Yes. So I've worked with Angular and I looked at custom and by limited number of and you your own filters. Can you create your own filters? Yes, the question is can you create your own filters? Um, everything that you see, so let's go back to this page. Everything that you see, everything that Angular does is completely pluggable. So what Angular is in its rawest form is just HTML compiler, and it has no preconceived notions about anything. So everything that you see on this page uh, can be overridden, changed, extended, added, or everything else that you desire. So if I wanted to add a new filter, all I have to do is say angular.filter, and then specify the name of the filter equals function, and off I go and write my own functions. Filters can be chained. Filters can have properties added to them, uh, and so on. Uh, so the other thing, right, yes. Other questions? Yes. So you uh, mentioned this, so sorry if I missed it, but uh, is the browser tool as well, because it's a, it's a advanced thing, like uh, This is, so the question is, what's the compatibility really with the browsers on this thing? Uh, I think that currently, in theory, this runs on IE6, but there are some issues with certain things like hovering, et cetera, which would require a little more love, which we could get. But as far as I know, IE6 is basically unsupported. So IE7 and higher, this thing works. It also works on mobile browsers, which are WebKit-based. Uh, we have it tested on. So all your gra uh, grade A browsers, this thing works just fine. Yes? Uh, right, so you're asking about speed in terms of updating a database. So Angular really doesn't uh, say anything about that. 
what Angular is is a way of rendering your, your content on a page, right? Now, typically the way it works is that you have a, uh, what we call a resource. So this particular resource has some URL and you can do get and you can do post, you can do uh, save on this particular URL and write JSON to it. How you handle it on a server side is obviously your problem and that's up to you. Although we have a second project called Arresti and one day we'll give a talk on that as well. Uh, but really, the only thing we provide is a way of calling a, uh, a data set or calling a URL on a server. The other thing we provide is, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys noticed, is this statement over here uh, is really looks synchronous, right? And if, for those of you guys who have been here for, for Ryan's talk uh, just before mine, you know, everything in JavaScript is really asynchronous. So how is it even possible that this thing executes? Uh, turns out what, what the activity that get does is indeed uh, asynchronous, which means it makes a call and at some point later the data comes back to me. But because of magic of data binding, what the activity that get does is it returns an empty shell object and it saves it into activities. And then the data binding simply renders nothingness. And at some point later, the resource comes back with the data and pre-populates that already empty shell and a data binding takes over and renders everything. And so what's missing out of this code, for those of you who have been building AJAX applications, is all of the callbacks. All the codebacks that are usually just littered throughout your code base, whether it's for listening on buttons, events, or talking to a server, are notably absent if you look through this piece of code. It's not that they're not there, it's that just we're using clever techniques of returning shell objects and relying on the fact that the data binding immediately takes effect that we simply don't have to deal with them. You say, go do this, you, you kind of queue it off and say, go fetch the data, and once the data comes back, you know, shove it in here, and you, you know how to render it, you don't need to involve me in the rendering process, because I already told you everything about rendering inside of the view. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry, how much does the memory of the browser actually increase with all the like, the memory? Okay, good question. So the question is, how expensive is this on a browser? Uh, we have done some measurements, not a lot. We're working on improving the speeds. Uh, I think we have an internal application that we were building using Angular, and I should point out that the application was built using GUID before that. Um, and when we rewrote it in Angular, we went from something like 17,000 line of code to about 1,000 lines of Angular code. And now the application does a lot, lot more, and it's actually 2,000 lines of JavaScript code. So you get a tremendous amount of savings. In terms of speed, uh, the load time is very fast. I think it's something on the order of 300 milliseconds. Uh, uh, to load, render, compile, and do everything. And I haven't really done much in terms of optimization yet. And as far as a live typical page that contains a reasonable amount of data, you're looking at about something about two to five megabytes of JavaScript code, uh, data code that's kind of running in the browser. This is for Chrome, so IE might be different, harder or larger, et cetera. Oh, how much is the library? Yes. Uh, the library itself is uh, under 50 kilobytes compressed and obfuscated. Uh, I have some ideas on how to make it even smaller, so in the future it might even get smaller. One thing that I like about this setup is because so much of it is declarative inside of the HTML, as the library gets, as the Angular library gets smarter, better, more efficient, right, everybody benefits. Uh, because you described how the application behaves rather than programmed every little nuance and every single callback. And so as over time Angular gets better, faster, supports more browsers, your application kind of gets it for free. Yes. Uh, question from VC. Uh, okay, go ahead, VC. Uh, apologies for just barging in. Um, so uh, I'm wondering about the DOM stability. So when Angular goes and recomputes the result of uh, uh, of the 
constraint system's output and then generates new HTML? Does it make any attempt to uh, keep old DOM nodes that didn't change um, around uh, when it's replacing them, or does it just wipe them all out with inner HTML? Uh, good question. So the question is, how do we do the updates? Uh, whether we do inner HTML or whether we modify the DOM. Currently, we are modifying DOM in place, and we're trying to be really smart about only talking to the DOM when we know something has changed, because it turns out that although WebKit is pretty good about talking to DOM and manipulating it, in IE, it's an absolute nightmare. You know, every single call to a DOM manipulation, you should be really careful about that you absolutely have to do it. And so we're really smart about manipulating the DOM as it is right now. Uh, however, there seems to be some evidence that you know, using just a brute force inner HTML might actually work better. And so in the future, it's possible that we're going to rewrite this particular process to just purely dump inner HTML into the whole page and just refresh it that way. It, it depends. You know, we'll see how the performance is going to end up, which one's going to be faster. But as of right now, we modify only the stuff that has changed. And keep in mind that because of bidirectional data binding, Anything that the user interacts with the DOM is really inside of the model. And so as long as the model gets preserved, we can redraw the, the DOM in exactly the same state. So it, that really isn't a problem of do we accidentally clubber something when we are redrawing. Like, it's not an issue. And I think you had a question, right? I'm sorry, I missed the second part. Oh, testing. Yes, thank you very much. Is it hard to test this thing? Oh, I'm sorry. How can I forget Mr. Testability myself, right? Thank you. It's almost like you queued this up. No. Thank you for asking. Uh, I love testability. So for those of you who know me, uh, I test drive all my code. And testability is something I take very, very seriously. And so uh, let's talk about this for a second. Imagine that you wanted to test the buzz controller that I have just created. Look at this piece of code. Is there anything in there that makes it hard to test? Uh, and the answer should be no. There's nothing in there that's inherently difficult. And the reason for that is, one, we're not manipulating any sort of DOM inside of the controller, which means I can just instantiate the controller, and off I go, call methods on it, and do any behavior I want. But there's one thing that kind of is a problem, and that is this whole activity object, right? Well, it turns out resources are so important and so common that we took all the stuff that the browser has and that we call, I affectionately call the global state of the browser, all the nastiness that's inside of the window, and we hid it behind this service called the browser. And for testability, we actually give you a mock browser. So in production, you get a real browser. Because we have dependency injection, we inject a real browser into your application. And that you know, has the global state that comes with the browser, and it's all in there. But in your test world, we give you an additional JavaScript file, which uh, hooks it up so that you get a mock browser. And then what you can do is you can uh, train, for example, XHR requests. So you can say something like, browser XHR, expect get on this URL, respond with this. And then you can write your controller, and you can write a test that basically says, instantiate the controller. And the controller, let's say, in some method goes and tries to talk to a resource. The browser says, oh, yeah, I already was trained that I was expecting this particular get. And so it responds with the appropriate data. And you can control at what point the data comes back through flushing, et cetera. So testability story is really, really nice, both because we provide these higher level objects that hide all the nastiness of the browser, and also because at no point in your code do you have to touch the DOM, right? Because the DOM is a separate piece of, of uh, DOM is really a view, and it's a projection of your model. So you don't modify the DOM. You really just modify the model, and model is just a plain old JavaScript object. So that's one thing that you can do in terms of unit testability. You know, great story, awesome stuff. For end-to-end -end test, we are working on a, an end-to-end -end, uh, framework. In a way, you can think of it as a Selenium. But the problem is the Selenium is that Selenium doesn't know how Angular works. And so if Selenium clicks on a button, it doesn't know when Angular says, I'm done redrawing. You can go and look at stuff. So our framework uh, actually closely works with the en uh, Angular engine. And so you can say stuff like, navigate to a particular URL. 
and then you know, verify that this button is present. But the framework is smart enough to say, all oh, right, navigate to particular URL really means that Angular has to run all the stuff and all these things are changing, and so I have to wait until Angular says, I'm done, so you can go on to the next step. And so it takes away all of the polling and all of the uh, nastiness that you really are, are faced with in typical uh, trying to do an end-to-end -end testing uh, in your system. And so you have nice, simple, declarative way of saying, I expect these things to be true, and uh, the end-to-end -end framework works closely with the Angular engine to make sure that, that it executes nicely, and you don't have any weights, and it runs pretty quickly uh, through the system. So thank you for the question. That was awesome. Yes, five minutes. Yes. I have four questions. Four questions. All right, let's do one at a time. How many people are working on it? Uh, mainly myself, there's another guy, uh, Adam Abrams, who works on it, uh, external to Google. Uh, uh, also, there's uh, the team in Google who is using it to build an internal application, and those folks, from time to time, there's about six of them, go and add stuff into it, but I'm usually the guy who does most of the heavy lifting over here. How's it licensed? Uh, MIT. How's the adoption? Uh, so far, we have a couple of people outside of Google and uh, two people inside of the Google. Uh, the people who are doing inside of the Google, actually, some of them are fa sitting in the audience. They absolutely love it. I mean, how can you complain when you delete 17,000 lines of GWT code and replace it with 1,000 and you have a beautiful testability story uh, and, and so on? Uh, so they love it. Yes, so you can go to documentation. AngularJS.org. Uh, it's still work in progress. I'm working on this daily. Uh, this is, for example, a media wiki for those of you who are familiar with. Media wiki is just what Wikipedia uses. Uh, the cool thing is you can go and edit <coughs> uh, the pages. So as long as you register yourself, the code is directly embedded in the code examples are directly embedded inside of the wiki. Uh, they automatically render into this kind of a view that basically shows you what the HTML looks like, plain and source, and you can actually play with the examples directly inside of the wiki. If I go to source and I copy this code, I can paste it into a file on your, my desktop and I can go off and play with this particular snippet as well. Uh, if you click on the documentation, you know a lot of these things are explained over here, all the attributes, all the magic that we currently support. Uh, the cookbook contains Typical things, you know, how do you do Hello World, how basic forms are usually done, how do you do model view controllers, deep linking with pages, somebody was asking me over here, uh, external resources, which is basically the Buzz demo client, which I have done over here, is done here, again, in 50 lines of code. As you can see, I can fetch the Google Buzz directly in here. You can look at the source code directly in line. So those are good resources to go and look at. Other questions? Yes. What are the open issues and biggest problems? Uh, my biggest problem is explaining to people what it is. <laughs> uh, it is, you know, people have these buckets in their head, like, oh, it's a library. Oh, so it's just like Clojure. Well, no, actually, Angular can actually benefit from Clojure because Clojure has lots and lots of uh, widgets that you can actually use with Clojure. Oh, Angular is like jQuery because it manipulates the DOM. Well, actually, Angular uses jQuery to manipulate DOM, but it's not the same thing as DOM manipulation framework, because I don't really give you an API to manipulate the DOM, right? It's all this data binding that happens for you. People say, well, it's a, uh, it's a framework for building web apps. Well, it's not really, because really it's, the, it's all about the HTML and teaching the browser new tricks. So explaining to people exactly what this thing is, is I'm having hard trouble. So if any of you got good, good at marketing, talk to me and help me out here. What was the second question? What are the problems? Uh, open issues, let's see. Uh, what are the open issues? Uh, we, we have some issues with when, you, when the data sets get r really large. Um, Chrome just chunks through them, no problem. Like I, I'm yet to build some app that would not run fast in Chrome. Uh, same thing for Safari. Firefox is reasonable. IE sometimes has troubles, and so one of the things we want to really focus now on next is making sure that uh, this thing performs on IE just as well as on all the other browsers. Now, when I say make the performance better, uh, I don't mean that it's currently slow. What I mean by that is if you have a large data set, like let's say you want to have a table with 1,000 rows, and each row contains 50 different bindings in it, right? And then you do something, it might take you know, a little bit of like 
just enough lag to know that it's not instantaneous, right? And I want to get rid of that. I want to make sure that in all browsers is essentially instantaneous. And so I have some ideas on how to make this thing better, and so it should probably get better in, uh, with time. The other thing I would like to do, and I'm hoping that some of the open source community could take on to it is, let's say I wanted to have charts inside of Angular, right? It would be awesome if I could simply, in my HTML, say bracket pie chart and point it to a data source, right? And so if the open source community would come up and say, oh, I'm going to write maybe a, the glue between Angular and Raphael, which is an open source library, or maybe Google Charts or something like that, to make it so you know, all of a sudden if the new person comes and says, I want to have charts in my application, all they have to do is drop a little bit of tag inside of it, no code necessary, right? Maybe animation to be included in there as well, and so on and so forth. So what Angular is today is a is a raw set of primitives. It's not really a rich widget library or anything like that, which I'm kind of hoping that people can pick up on. And I think we're out of time. So I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, see you guys later.